This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. Today's sponsor is A2 Hosting. I've been using A2 Hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many, many years now and absolutely love their support, their service, and all the features that you get. You get access to cPanel. You get all of the things that you can imagine for a great WordPress experience, including their A2 optimized WordPress, which does extra security checks, extra lockdown. You can lock down your editor uh, file so you can't edit anything inside there. You get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done. Um, You can also do automatic updates, backups, and more with A2 hosting. So highly recommend it. Go to a geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid state turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's a geekleader.com slash A2. All right, Geek Leaders. Today I'm honored to have Joshua Wola on the show, and he is a co-founder, um, a CTO at uh, Super Awesome, which they which he sold or, or was acquired by Epic Games and is now the uh, founder and CEO of Mindstone. And with all that being said, Josh, you've had an amazing journey and an amazing career kind of moving up through here uh, from tech to entrepreneurship. Just tell the audience about kind of how you got to where you are today and welcome to the show. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to, to the conversation. So uh, it, it's been a, definitely an interesting start. Uh, I, I still hope I have a, a lot left, but it's been a, it's been a good start indeed. Um, I guess to start with, I mean, I, I'm a self-taught coder. So when I was, what, 11, 12, started getting into coding was initially a, a high school kind of extracurricular class that um, got me extra interested in it. It was, it was the simplest thing you could do at the time, which was HTML and JavaScript and kind of putting it in a browser and figuring out and, and things started happening. Um, and that's really where it, where it got started. I've been a big game or I used to be a big gamer and so the the very start of getting introduced to, to computers really was was just wanting to understand how games worked um, and then starting to, to build my own and then figuring out that actually building games was much harder than building websites or building functional apps uh, and so I ended up uh, using at some point my, my skills because a, a friend of my dad's wanted to wanted a website and he was willing to pay for it and uh and that paid more and was certainly more fun to do than babysitting. And so I, I ended up doing that. Um, that was what, at 16. Uh, by the age of 20 or so, then had ballooned into uh, about 30 students building websites for private business, uh, private uh, banks all across Geneva, because I was living in uh, Switzerland at the time. So that, that was kind of the first experience of, of building a company. Um, I had an interesting kind of past with, with education. I've been always very, um, very interested in how people learn. I dr- dropped out, for started, dropped out of university twice. I ended up actually doing my computer science degree when I was 23, moved to London to do, uh, to do that. With the main idea there was really that I had built this business um, with basically just learning whatever I needed to learn, what my clients had asked for. So I would sell something, I wouldn't necessarily know exactly how to do it. And then I would figure out how to do it in order to deliver on it. Um, but it left me not necessarily understanding, wait, what, what does the full landscape of computer science really look like? What are my unknown unknowns? And so I thought one of the ways to, to do that was to get a degree. Um, also, the reality is that I, I thought we were still living in a world where not having a degree had the potential of, of blocking me one day in terms of where I wanted to, to get to. So I thought, well, let's, let's kind of get that squared off. So I did that. Right out of university um, there, I then started a company called Super Awesome, which you mentioned. Um, I was not the only one, there were five of us starting the company. Uh, that The mission of the company was to build a safer internet for kids. Uh, during the first four years of, of Super Awesome, I did my MBA. This was remotely um, through the Open University. So that was um, another type of learning experience, I guess. So but again, kind of a, a little bit of a, a thread through my life there. I kind of had different learning experiences that come on. I'd say probably one of the better ones because I would learn between 6 and 8 a.m. and then I'd get to the office at 8.30 or 9. And sometimes literally 
actually apply what I would have been reading in the morning. Uh, and so the feedback loop was as close as you possibly can get. Uh, nine times out of 10, it was wrong and it, it just yeah. blew up. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes something actually worked and it made it better. Um, and so it, it was really interesting. That company, so super awesome, uh, went on to become the biggest kids technology company in the world. Um, that was acquired by Epic Games. So this was the summer of 2020. And I then went on to start a new company, which, um, again, the thread of learning being being what it is. I'd, I'd started investing in the education space uh, about two years prior to the, the exit of, of Super Awesome, um, sitting down with other founders, other investors, understanding with what are the, the macro trends that the industry is dealing with, what are the problems other founders are trying to, to solve and why, and then thought, well, now, now that I got the, the privilege to figure out where I wanted to spend the next 20 or 30 years of my life in terms of headspace. Like what are the types of problems that I wanted to solve? I thought education was kind of the space I wanted to be in um, and started Mindstone um, with a, a few ideas, but, but fundamentally uh, the, the mission of the company is to surface and accelerate the world's informal learning uh, with the idea being that we are all learning from the internet today, an enormous amount, right? From, best practice articles, uh, videos, podcasts, even tweet threads. Like we're, we're, we're using all of that in order to, to improve our skills to get better at what we're doing. Um, but none of it is getting quantified. Uh, and, and so like there's no trace of anything we do in that way. And uh, other than when you're maybe an engineer and you have a Stack Overflow profile or a GitHub profile where some of that kind of sticks and you have a proof of it, if you try and learn and you're a financial analyst, but you learn yourself, there is nothing you have to show for it. And trying to find a job afterwards is pretty hard. Um, on top of that, basically, we have never really been taught how to learn. And over the last 20 years, as a society, we have, we have discovered quite a bit about how the brain works. But no one really understand, uh, or very few people know how to apply a few techniques that would dramatically accelerate the pace at which you can learn. Uh, I'm not talking about like small things or, or ad hoc studies, like things that have been proven over and over again, like spaced repetition, which, which dramatically improves the amount of information or um, how much you retain from what you're engaging with and things like that. So, so that's kind of one. And then the second piece is that, that you have this interesting phenomenon called the, or they call it the skill gap, which is this, this idea that you have unemployment while you still have an enormous amount of jobs that are going unfulfilled. And so, and that gap is getting bigger, bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger. So you have on the one hand companies that are looking for, or for, for people with specific talents in order to, to do specific jobs, they can't find them, but the proxies they use to try and find those people are the old paradigm of how people learn, which is degrees and certificates, potentially experience, names of companies you work for. On the other end, you have people, as I was talking about, that are learning from the internet, learning themselves, building up their skill levels, actually able to do the job, but they're not able to um, surface because they don't have the right credentials in a different way, right? And so right. We're, uh, we're kind of trying to, to solve that problem by... Uh, the, the way we, we sometimes talk about it is we're, we're building the Stack Overflow plus Fitbit for learning in a way, if that makes so, sense. With yeah, yeah. So I, I know I've hired people in the past um, with multiple degrees. You know, I've got multiple degrees and, you know, that's a way of kind of, you know, seeing what they've done before. But I've also hired, you know, I, I, I've said this a couple of times and I'll, I'll continue to say it, probably the best developer that I've ever worked with when it comes to just pure being able to, to code. Um never graduated high school, um, dropped out of, you know, he got his GED, went to an, um, a two-year school, dropped out of that. And when it came to his ability to actually be able to code, he, he was by far the most talented uh, software developer that I've ever hired. And he had nothing, you know, like you're saying, nothing to show for it. He, you know, how did he learn this stuff? Well, he learned on it by going to forums, goofing off, you know, playing, uh, trying to make his own games, hacking into games he could you know be better at the building uh you know a, a tools so he could win at different things and, and he didn't have anything to show for it so how is it that someone like that how is it that you, your tool can, can kind of quantify someone like that and his experience and his ability yeah. to help him you know get a job because you know the only reason i even interviewed him was because someone said hey you've got to interview this guy like yeah. trust so, me you have to interview this guy yeah so i i'd say in engineering, and to a degree, sometimes in uh, around design, you're now starting to have a similar thing. You, um, 
the problem is half solved because you have things like Stack Overflow, GitHub, or portfolios. Like the benefit right. of engineering is that you, I can send you over my code and you can actually look at what I've, what I've built. You can look at a Stack Overflow profile, see which questions I asked, how I answered them, and so on, and how the, the community values that. Um, same for a GitHub profile, same for a design portfolio. I can send it over to you and you have a, an actual proof of the work that I produced. Obviously, you can then have a discussion around it to validate mm -hmm. if it was mine, like all of that stuff. But there's something that's left behind. Um, and today, most hiring managers in engineering would value a GitHub or a Stack Overflow profile higher than a degree from a university, um, just based on the fact that you have that transparency and that it's based on real work rather than a stamp from, from some institution. Now, you don't have the same thing in other domains, however. If you're, so I, I think as was mentioning, if you're a financial analyst and you are building yourself up and trying to figure out how to do this, and then you try to, uh, to find a job, you'll, you won't get any interviews. I was going to say you're going to get laughed out of the room, but you don't even get into the room. Right. Um, so that is, that is the real problem. And interesting enough, companies actually um, acknowledged this, pro uh, this problem. I was talking to the head of talent for one of the biggest, actually yeah, one of the biggest consultancy groups in the world. And they're, they're famous for just hiring from um, top tier universities. And they know that they're excluding 98% of the world's talent, which is an even bigger problem now post COVID where like companies are able to starting to tap into to talent all over the world. Um, they're aware of the fact that they're not tapping into it. Now, the reason is that their interview to hire ratio is a uh, starts dropping through the floor once they don't have the proxy of degrees or uh, qualifications to, to look at. And so it's not that they don't want to access the other 98%. They know that it could dramatically improve their business. But if they have to do a thousand interviews for a single hire, that's never going to work. Yeah. So the problem is that there's no signaling mechanism. It's that those 98% don't have an easy way to showcase that they have the skills. And that is, that is the key. So if you are able to start to quantify this, um, in a way that would be respect, or respected by employers, then those the 98% would suddenly be able to compete for those jobs and they would be surfaced in a way that companies could find them as well. And so the um, one way of looking at it, so the way, the way it was, um, uh, that we're building is this is from all the, what's called the informal learning, right? So all the stuff that's not currently going quantified. Now, Stack Overflow does this in an interesting way where every question is, is upvoted, every answer is, is upvoted or downvoted in this way. And basically your, your interaction or engagement with the content, the, the, the competence you show to the community shows up in your reputation score. Right. And so our idea is to do something similar, but across all the content that you engage with. So every podcast you listen to, every article you read, every video you watch, mm -hmm. um, we can start to quantify the highlights you make on it, the comments you have, the questions you ask, the answers you give. Um, again, there will be a strong community component to it in, in the longer run. We, we haven't built out the full vision yet, right? We're, we're, we've only been building this for about two years now. But you can imagine where you start to see every action that you make with this piece of content and how you employ it starts to be quantified into a skill profile, which would then constitute a signal that you could uh, take away with you to an employer who could then, and, and the key here is we don't have to make that signal good enough that someone can hire you from it. We just need to make it good enough that someone decides to interview. Because once they talk to you, that's kind of, that's the bar we need to hit, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I How think- How much control is would like uh, the individual have of something like this? Like, like, for example, you know, I definitely want my, you know, future employers to know that I'm listening to a Geek Leader podcast or stuff you should know, you know, things like that, that I'm educational, but maybe I don't want them to know I'm listening to Russell Brand as well or Joe Rogan <laughs> or something like that, you know? Yeah. So the idea obviously is that the, is that the individual has entire control over what is part of that skill profile, right? If you don't want specific activity to show up, you don't have, um, have to have that show up. It's totally under your control. Right. 
Okay. And, you know, when, when you, I, I do a lot of my learning through uh, YouTube, you know, I, I'll go to YouTube, I'll watch a tutorial, I'll, I'll try it out and see how it works. But I'm also one of those, I'm not, I'm not a person that comments, like, I just, I just don't do it, you know, but I do learn a lot that way. And um, is there a way that, that we could maybe in, incorporate some of the, um, you know, sample code that I'm playing around with and testing that I, I, I want to put that out there. I want to create a portfolio of some sort, but I don't want this to be like real projects. Just, just some, someone can see some of the successes yeah. that I'm having. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, our main, to, to be clear, our main focus is not necessarily engineering at the moment, Correct. or at least, sorry, not, not writing code type engineering. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, because there are, th that's the one space where some solutions exist, right? The, With GitHub um, and, yeah, I, I get, exactly. Yeah. But the idea is, is very, very correct, which is that it's not just about the consumption material. It is also about what you do with it, what you produce, and then starting to catalog that in different ways as well so that it builds up that skill profile so that you can end up with um, potentially a sort of, some sort of portfolio of produced works in different spaces that all contribute to that, um, that skill record indeed. Uh, I, I'm not going to stand here and say that we have all the answers already. I'm not like... It's not like we know exactly what are all the signals that are going to make up the skill profile yet. What I can say is that if you think about how degrees have gotten smaller and smaller, right? You're starting to get certificates for like one week type courses. Yeah. Uh, we're thinking this the, from the other end point of the spectrum, where rather than going smaller and smaller, we're starting from the smallest possible unit. Every highlight, every comment, every question, every answer. And then we're going to be building up what we think is the most um, representative skill profile that you can make from all of the interactions that happen at atomic level kind of uh, uh, underneath, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. And, um, you know, I I'm guessing your research is showing there's probably less and less people um, going to four-year schools out there. And right now, you know, I we have this great resignation going on where people are like switching jobs all over the place. And, you know, even me trying to hire someone can be rather difficult uh, because you know, like you said, if you do get a flood of resumes, you're going to try to weed those down. So you're not interviewing a ton of people, but a lot of times by the time you interview them, they're already gone. You know, you've already lost that person. So then you're like, Holy crap. What do I, you know? And I don't know. It's, it's a, I don't even know where I'm going with this question. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the need overall is, is massive, right? There are is, yeah. one big stat that was this kind of underpinning a lot of um, the thesis of the company itself is, uh, was it in 2019, McKinsey predicted that by 2030, about 60% of, sorry, about 30% of the tasks of 60% of occupations in 2019 will be entirely automated by 2030. So you're talking about 30% of the tasks of six people in 10 that are going to have, so that are going to be entirely automated, right? So this is an average, which means some people will have big chunks of their jobs automated, some will be, uh, be less, but it's a massive amount of people that are going to have to replace what they're currently doing, a big portion of what they're currently doing with something new, whether it is changing industries entirely or just replacing it within existing jobs, you know, what's called upskilling, kind of uh, getting, getting skills that are, are not getting automated. Now, this is a type of learner that are adults. They are in the workforce. And our entire system has been built for people that are not. If you think about it, there are a few fundamental principles that are just at odds with, with the way that adults would learn. Like one, one is that our entire system has been built with the idea that learning should be the center of your life when you are in learning mode. Right? We even talk about having a side job next to some kind of uh, university. Right? Whilst if you have a job, you have a family, you might have a mortgage to pay, like you can't, that learning has to fit around your life, not the other way around. Right. right. Um, and that is, that is a really interesting one. Uh, and so there are a bunch of different kind of second, third or the consequences around this. One of the biggest ones being that for the first time you start to have alignment between kind of the person that pays is the person that does the learning. And so that is really interesting because it means that there are new business models that are becoming viable. Whereas before it was kind of only government or targeted to parents, because kind of those were the two that would end up paying for it. You have bigger, uh, more and more budgets coming from, from companies that are now investing in this, but also more and more individuals investing in their own learning. Um, so that's interesting. The other piece 
is that we are at this point in time where we have never had as much access to information. We have never produced as much information as we do today. Like the, the last stat I was looking at was like every hour, there are about 40 years worth of YouTube video being uploaded. Wow. Something just like completely impossible to even think about, right? And so, I mean, granted, a lot of that is not worth much. Um, but there is a there is a segment that actually is. And there is a smaller segment even that is just absolutely amazing content that you can properly learn from. And it's already way too much to ever consume. Um, and so even though we're now in this world where like we went from a world where access to information was scarce to a world where we have the opposite problem. There is too much information. And our challenge is to try and figure out wait, how do I make the most of it? But somehow in education, we are still using the same model. The idea of a lecturer standing in front of or, or sitting on a Zoom call in front of 300 people because the best way to disseminate knowledge was to have the one person with access to the book or the one person that could read divulge that to everybody else. Like that, that is an age that used to exist hundreds of years ago. Yes. But it's no longer the case. Each one of us can, or majority of us, within a few seconds, can get the information. That's not the problem. The problem is trying to figure out how you learn from it. And I don't think our current system has, is, has anywhere near evolved to try and cater to that, that particular challenge. And so that's a really important piece that we try and, and uh, make progress with, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Because I know I've met people um, before that are like... Uh... You know, when I think back to when I was running a business, you know, building websites, you mentioned that you started kind of in that same, same realm, you know, as a side gig when you're starting out and I, I needed someone to help me market, right. And do SEO work and things like that. That's a different skill set, but everybody thinks so if you build a website, you can do SEO too, but they're two very different things. And yes. the only way in the past to really show that you had that knowledge was either to get a four year degree in marketing or go get your, you know, Google certificate and, you know, Google AdWords or something like that. But there's a whole thing in between there. You know, there's a lot of other stuff. Like, how do I know if I'm good at Facebook marketing or maybe Instagram or, you know, how do you know all these different nuances and how can I ask someone? Because I don't know the questions to properly ask someone, are you a good Facebook marketer? <laughs> you know? so, so I think having something like this where people can show the fact that they've learned these certain things, they've read these things, they've watched these YouTube videos, they've you know, done some practice campaigns on their own. And here's how, how they've, how their skills have evolved it is really important in the, yeah. you know, changing market when it comes to hiring the right people and finding the right people, not just for your permanent full-time job, but also for like things I want to outsource to. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, with all that, how, how can one get started with something like this? With, with Mindstone? Or, or yeah, Mindstone or, or, you know, just showing that they have, you know, yeah. uh, I, you know, right now with after COVID, a lot of people are changing careers or changing directions. They're going somewhere different. They're, they're interested in something else. And they want to make sure that they have, they're putting their best foot forward when it comes to um, what skills that they've learned and acquired over, over time. And how can someone get started, you know, showing that? So I think the reality is there's, there are very few options nowadays. That's the, that's the problem, right? The, uh, there is stuff out there you can you can try and go for like micro certificates or things like that on on udemy udacity coursera even linkedin learning like all of those are they do exist they are starting to get valued somehow somewhat depending on the industry you go into like you you have to figure out how much of this is is total bs and how much of this is actually being valued right um so like in engineering the best thing is to just go and do uh build up your your skill level and then um, showcase some projects. Uh, but that's not the case for, for other domains. Now, as people reskill, there's actually a big movement from a bunch of different industries into engineering, for example. And so boot camps are a big, mm -hmm. uh, a really popular option right now with, where, uh, with some of them actually paying you to do the boot camp and you pay off the boot camp um, over time based on the increase of salary that you get which is a, an interesting one. I think Lambda School is doing some really cool stuff in the US, for example. Um, so that, that's a, a decent option. Uh, it depends as well at the level that you're looking at. If you are kind of an executive, uh, executive level trying to switch industries, then 
boot camps can be a really, yeah, or not boot camps, but um, kind of executive type retraining is still something that's being used quite a lot. Um, if you're going down to the start, uh, kind of the bottom of the ladder with whatever industry you're in, then um, weirdly enough, again, certificates are being valued more. So it's it's really not an easy thing to do right now, which is why we want to help and try and make it a little bit better, I guess. Yeah. Do you, have you guys, um, I know you said, you know, this is still kind of a, uh, you don't have all the answers yet and you're working towards that. Is this something that you would see maybe like, um, um, uh, managers or department leads having their teams use at, at, at work as well? Because, you know, right now, what, what are your options for training? You can send people to conferences, you can send people to boot camps, you can do LinkedIn learning, but you know, again, there's a lot of people on my team that will go find much better skills through YouTube or something like that. That's not really, you know, quantifiable. And it's also kind of strange where, you know, I'm like, Hey, I need you to learn this new, you know, technology. And they go off and say, Oh yeah, I learned it on YouTube. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't want to tell my boss that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, long-term, absolutely. Um, however, we are, we're, we're very convinced that in order to, create the best possible user experience. Um, we want to make sure that the, the, the user that we're optimizing for is actually the learner. Um, there are a bunch of different reasons on that. One is that it just facilitates for the best possible learning and the best possible learning at the end of the day will actually pay off for the employer as well because they'll, they'll get it. Um, the second piece is that there, uh, that I think that there with this shift of Alignment between the learner and the pay, sorry the, the user and the payer here. Um, there is room to build a company that is specifically built for the consumer and their ability to to upskill, reskill, and basically take ownership of their own learning. Because I think that is actually one of the problems that uh, exists today, which is that people are expecting somebody else to help them upskill or reskill rather than taking that ownership into their own hands. Uh, sometimes I, I think about um, the next 10 years where like, we need to do for learning what Nike did for fitness. If you think about 15 years ago or so, how people thought about their fitness, it was not something that was front of mind. It was not something that um, especially someone in a knowledge intensive industry, very few people would kind of put that as top of their top of their things to, to get right. Nowadays, people are taking their fitness seriously and they're part of their routine. Even if you don't have it part of your routine, you know you should, and you are most of the time trying to figure out a way to get there. We are not there yet with learning. People have not taken ownership of their learning in a general sense yet. And I think that's a mental shift that needs to happen over the next 10 years. I think it's going to happen because you have more automation. And so more people are forced into reskilling, upskilling. And so I think that whole engagement with learning is going to change, but I think that's a really important bit. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I think ownership is extraordinarily important. And that's one of the, you know, I had a discussion with someone not too long ago, we were talking about education and um, they had the stance that, you know, all higher education should be free. And I'm like, well, I get that. And, and I get that student loans is kind of a really bad thing to get trapped into, especially, you know, you're looking at an 18 year old and having them sign, you know, something to, to pay off a hundred thousand dollars when they really don't know what they want to do with their career. Their brains aren't fully formed yet, but I get that. But if we made it all free, then there's no stake in the game. You know, there's no, uh, like you go, go back to ownership. There's, there's no reason for me to actually like complete this and go through with it and, and, and put forth the effort and, and being a professor, I, I see, you know, part-time at, at Winthrop university, I see sometimes that, yeah, students don't need to be in college. They can get the skills, you know, somewhere else and do it better. And sometimes there's not a good ROI on college, but the fact that they are putting, you know, money into the game, they, they take an ownership to actually learn it and get value out of it. Whereas if it was free and there's no real, like, uh, there's no consequence for, for doing it. then sometimes there's no real effort that gets put into it and they don't take ownership of it. So I see what you're yeah. saying. Well, and there's also a, um, in the same, on the same kind of wavelength, there is the disassociation of, of effort and, and impact or effort and, and, and reward that comes out by right? the, mm -hmm we're all aware of the fact that depending on what you're learning, your earning potential is going to be dramatically different. Um, and so I don't think it serves people to enter university 
blind to that as if it's like, well, just choose whatever you want and you're going to be entirely fine. It's totally fine for, for anyone to choose whatever they want to study and whatever they want to learn. But I do think it is productive to also understand, wait, this, this part will currently reward you more in the economy than this other part over here that you might be studying. Now, if you still want to go and study that, all, all good on you. But doing that without understanding the link between those. And so when you think about kind of everything being free, if that comes at the expense of people making a decision of, wait, um, where do I want to go in order to build a life? Uh, I'm not entirely sure if that is, uh, is, is, is properly productive either. Right? Yeah. Hmm. No, yeah, I get, I get you. It's, it's really, I get, it's one of those, it's not an easy answer. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, how can people learn more about MindStone and maybe get started with it and, and connect with you if they have any questions on, on using something like this? Yeah, so you can go to, to mindstone.com, uh, www.mindstone.com. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very happy we got that domain. Um, uh, currently, we are, uh, we're not onboarding everyone yet, so you can try and sign up. Um, there are a few questions, and depending kind of on, on how that lands, we, we might or might not be ready um, for uh, for your type of usage yet. If, if someone is particularly keen to give it a go, uh, just DM me on Twitter uh, at Joshua Voda and I can, I can make sure that uh, you, you, you have your, your time to try the app. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I'll uh, link that up in the show notes too at geekleader.com. And yeah, Josh, I really appreciate having you on the show. I think it's been a good conversation. Hey, thank you very much for having me. If anyone has any more questions, just reach out. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also, don't forget to check out merch. We have some T-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on geekleader.com. Um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also, don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.